According to Bloomberg, Page has invested in not one but two flying car startups, Z.Aero and Kitty Hawk. Uh, Z.Aero has poached aerospace designers, professors, and engineers from NASA, Boeing, SpaceX, Stanford, and others. Bloomberg says they've been testing uh, two single-seat prototypes that look like small planes, whereas Kitty Hawk's prototype looks like a passenger drone. Now, Ian, yesterday we talked about how uh, the E-Hang autonomous passenger drone has just been approved for testing in the Nevada desert, um, which seems to me sort of like a flying car. What is up with this obsession that uh, tech people have with flying cars. Well, we were discussing this in the in the office earlier today, and the considered opinion was that it came down to the Jetsons. Mm. Uh, I have my doubts about that since, I mean, flying cars were a central part of Olaf Stapledon's uh, science fiction in the 1930s. I think it's a logical extension of cars, which is something we're ever familiar with, and flying, which is something that most people would really like to do on their own. And, uh, I mean, over the years, hundreds of millions of dollars have been plowed into researching and trying to build flying cars of all types, I mean, some with bolt-on wings that bolted onto a standard car and then took off. There's a the famous Moller, aircraft, uh, Moller flying car, which could just about take off, and that's it. There's always willing, you know, there's always people willing to burn through VC cash to do this, and also, you know, there's a willingness on behalf of, on behalf of people like Larry Page to fund this kind of dream, despite the fact that if they actually thought it through, I suspect it would become a nightmare. If you think about it, you think about the number, we, we lose about 30,000 people a year on, on the roads just with normal road adhesive cars. When you've got flying cars and when people, if people fly the way they drive, then you're going to have these things falling out the sky on fairly regular basis. So, I mean, I'm very, very skeptical about the whole flying car thing. That said, however, there could have been a person just like me 100 years ago going, you know, this newfangled automobile thing will never take off. No match for a good pair of horses under a man's buttocks. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's it swings and roundabouts. Give it five, ten years and an awful lot of development and an awful lot of cash, they might come up with something, but then they'd face the same problem that autonomous cars have. The technology is very, really, very nearly ready there to go onto the road. The problem is getting the lawmakers and people to actually accept it on the road. And I think accepting that in the skies is going to be a very hard sell indeed. Hey, I mean, what's the difference between a flying car and a helicopter, really? I mean, except for there would be more of them and more accidents like you're talking about? Well, I mean, the the principle originally was that you had a car which could convert into a plane and then they found out fairly quickly that this was very difficult because cars are very heavy and very underpowered. Um, I think the the dream a lot of people have is, uh, it, first off, the, the, the aircraft would be vertical takeoff and landing, so you don't have to have runways dotted around the landscape which isn't such a problem in the US where you've got the space, but in Europe would be an absolute killer. Um, so vertical takeoff and landing, you've got to have the software to enable anyone can do it without having to get a pilot's license. People like the idea of the convenience of, of taking off from their back garden and landing on the office at work every day. But thinking about the practicalities of traffic management in particular, then it's, it's, it's going to be, a, it's one of those things which technically it's doable, but in practice, you know, it's, it, it's just not quite there yet. We need something that you're going to need to have get an entire infrastructure and legal system built around this that can handle it and the liabilities that are involved. Well, do you think we can make anything of the fact that there's two different ones that he's funding? I mean, he's given over a hundred million dollars um, in total, I think, to Z Aero and then Kitty Hawk, uh, which I guess some people dug up that um, the head of Kitty Hawk is Sebastian Thrun, who is the uh, kind of the godfather of the self-driving car project at Google. He's uh, head of research for Google X. Um, so, I mean, do you think that this is really a Google project that they're working very hard to pretend is not? Well, I suspect what happened is they pitched it to, to Google as a Google project and Google senior management said, that's a bit of a step too far for us. We'll do the cars thing, but flying cars, that's a bit dicey, you see. So I think he, in the end, it was just a question of, I want to do this, $100 million. Well, I can find that down the back of the sofa if I wore the wrong trousers the other day. And, you know, it's well, not quite, but you know what I mean. And uh, he's willing to put his own money behind it, which is, you know, admirable in many ways. I hope and I hope he succeeds, but... I think it isn't a Google project directly, otherwise they would have put direct funding in. I think what's happened is they've said, well, look, you can borrow some of our engineers once in a while, you can hire your own staff, but spend your own money on it, not ours. The piece in Bloomberg is is really fascinating. I, I recommend anyone read it because it really um, talks also about, you know, that, that Jetson's idea that you mentioned before and this idea that Silicon Valley is somehow going to the promises that we will have flying cars, but instead what they've given us is, is Twitter, you know, which is just, yeah. okay. 
<laughs> but I mean, I, I was thinking today, like, you know, there was a, I mean, probably very few people spend as much time on Twitter a day as journalists or that I do um, in what is not necessarily the healthiest of my behaviors. But, you know, it was just the outpouring on Twitter was, you know, Trump versus Clinton. And, you know, they were going back and forth. And hey, it's pretty amazing to me when we talk about Twitter as just like oh, Twitter, like that. Those are the people that are running for president of the United States. Like that's a pretty big deal that they're like fighting it out on Twitter. I mean, and the fact that we can all just watch that. I mean, some a lot of people were pointing to it. It's just like they're acting like children. It's disappointing. But in some ways, it is. It is amazing that we have this technology that uh, that can uh, create this sort of participation. Oh, indeed. It's it's. I mean, it's both amazing and slightly worrying as well. You see, I mean, 20, 20 years ago, Donald Trump wouldn't have been able to get into the situation he was because he wouldn't have been able to speak directly to the voters unless he had access He had access given to him by the media and by the establishment. Now he has his own social media access. He can go out and say whatever the hell he likes. There was a marvellous report, I think it was in WAPO today, about his uh, aides getting very worried that he was just going to jump the gun and announce his vice presidential nomination over Twitter without any reference back to the campaign team. So, I mean, it's... It's both a blessing and a curse in that it's a it, we get much more direct contact um, with with people through it. Uh, at the same time, it's a curse in that it, it's kind of engendered a sort of I, I do think that discourses the level of, of of public discourse both in amongst politicians but also amongst general people have has has really sort of gone downhill, if you like, in with the ease and the and the multiplicity of social media outlets out there. It's difficult to imagine people insulting each other directly face-to-face -face or, in, or in writing in the way that they do online. There seems to be something about the semi-anonymity of, of being online plus the speed with which you get your message out there, which encourages discourtesy. And I, I have to say, I find that slightly worrying. Mm -hmm. And no wonder we just think, oh, if only we had our flying cars, everything would be wonderful. <laughs> I, I just don't get this obsession with flying cars. I mean, it's... Yeah, okay, flying's great. Well, okay, flying usually great if you're not going with, um, I won't say the airline's name, but <laughs> I think I think you we all know who we're talking about it begins with you. Um, so, um, I mean, flying is great. Flying has always been, uh, has been sort of a, a passion with mankind for you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci designed his own helicopter, for goodness sake. And it's, it's something which, which gets the mind. And we're so close to being able to do it. I mean, we've had jetpacks since the 1950s. They haven't been very good and they can't last very long, but they do exist. Flying cars, we've had the ability to convert a car into a flying vehicle for about 50 years. But again, very short range, very difficult to handle, and you, do need, you did need an airstrip. Now the idea is to go to for vertical takeoff and landing and then flying. I mean, it's if it works, it could be very interesting. But as I say, you've got all kinds of problems about flight management, about liability, about... What happens if somebody, you know, suddenly drops out of the air on top of your head? You know, it's, well, in case that happens, you die. But, I mean, what happens when the people try and sue the person who drops on your head? But, you know, so, I mean, it, it, the flying cars, it's, it's one of those things. And in a way, I really support Larry for putting his money behind it. Because, as you say, he's trying to build something concrete. This isn't just, you know, it, it's one of the, there was a great speech last year where, where somebody was decrying the finest minds of, of the computer science of his generation aren't trying to work out new fundamental problems. They're trying to work out better ways to sell advertising to people. And that's not, in the way, in, at the end of the day, very productive towards future human development. Whereas actually building things like, like, like Page is trying to do here, like Musk is doing with the transport network, you know, these are important things which humanity is going to need to get a grip on. And if tech billionaires are willing to throw a few hundred million at it, then I say more power to them. Exactly. I mean, I think Elon Musk is a great example of that. I mean, all of his projects are designed to make the world a better place, essentially. I mean, as crazy as it is, you know, he's not, uh, he's, he's yes, selling us cars, uh, but, but cars that are designed to um, make the planet last longer. Indeed, indeed. And I'm, I mean, I've seen with, with people with, particularly with Tesla buyers, uh, but also with SpaceX fans, uh, and to an extent with SolarCity users, they have this kind of fanboyish or fangirlish attraction to the companies and, and, the, and the personalities behind them. I've yet to hear a Tesla person slag off their car. They all love them to bits. SpaceX fans, you know, are all agog at, at what Musk has done to, to really revolutionize the rocket the rocketry industry. Mm -hmm. um, and they've got the kind of brand support that, that Steve Jobs would have dreamed of having for Apple. 
It's very interesting times. If you actually build something, and particularly if you build something in America, then U.S. buyers in particular really love it. 